الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اللهم ارنا حق حق وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطل وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ان شاء الله just a uh, quick summary uh, of some ayat in the Quran uh, some of this would have been mentioned yesterday in the khutbah so my apologies if uh, this is a repeat but for those that weren't here inshallah this will be of uh, some benefit uh, the first thing is that many of the verses in the Quran uh, that we otherwise may not have considered uh, they start to come alive in the current genocide that we find ourselves uh, facing as the Muslim Ummah. A lot of these verses we might have brushed aside and not really paid much attention to. They, uh, we understand them in a different light, in light of the events taking place in Palestine. And many of these verses in particular are those verses wherein Allah SWT discusses the events of the Battle of Uhud and the Battle of Al Ahzab, both of these particular battles. And uh, the uh, verses which discuss the Battle of Uhud, many of them can be found in Surah Ali Imran, and we'll discuss one of them, uh, inshallah, in this uh, short khatira as well. So Allah SWT mentions in the Quran, He says, ما كان الله ليدر المؤمنين على ما أنتم عليه حتى يميز الخبيث من الطيب. In these verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He will not leave you on the condition that you are in until He separates between the good and the bad, from the pure and the impure, from those that are righteous, from those that are trash. Whenever you find a situation in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to remove the Muslimin from a certain condition, He will not do so until He does this. And what we can understand and gauge from this is that historically a lot of Muslims they might have been confused as to which group was right. Whether it was a particular group of Muslims and there might have been some gray as to which group was right and upon the, tr or the true path. Likewise, it could have been for some Muslims. They were confused as to whether you could support certain politicians. Are they for us or are they against us? Likewise, for certain Muslims, they might have been confused with respect to the media or with respect to the CPS, the Calvary Police Service, as many of us experienced firsthand or secondhand or they saw what happened to our Muslim brothers and sisters in a lot of protests. And a Muslim might have been confused with respect to the media, the schools, and all of these various entities that we have in society. However, in a situation of war, in this context, Allah SWT makes it no longer a matter of gray, but now it becomes a matter of black and white. So on this area, now it becomes very easy for you to classify people. It becomes very easy for a person to classify people and entities as to where they fall on this particular spectrum. And this ayah was revealed in a particular context as well. This ayah was revealed in uh, the events which preceded the Battle of Uhud. Uh, it's mentioned that uh, the Mushrikeen, uh, when they fought against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr, Badr took place coincidentally, in the sense that it was not a planned battle, but rather it took place coincidentally. It just so happened that it happened. And when the Mushrikeen lost that particular battle, then they wanted revenge. And one of the uncles of the Prophet Wasallam, Al-Abbas, uh, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, he was a secret Muslim at the time. And because of this, he was in Mecca and he was able to get some information about the battle which is to come, which is the battle of Uhud. And he was able to convey this to the Prophet ﷺ in advance. And in so doing, the Prophet ﷺ, after this point, he made certain plans and preparations to prepare, prepare for this assault. And there were some elderly from among the Sahaba that said, let us stay in the city of Medina to Munawwara because it offers a type of natural protection. As we know, in the battle which followed, which was the Battle of Al Ahzab, there is one uh, section of Medina in which they built the trench. They didn't build it all around Medina. There's only one section in which they built a trench because there are mountains on either side. There are palm groves and date groves and a type of natural fortification in the city of Medina. So the elderly that had experience, they said, let's station ourselves here and wait for the enemy to come us and defend ourselves in the city of Medina. The youth, they disagreed, because youth can sometimes be overzealous, and they have a lot of energy. And they said a lot of them that missed the battle of Badr, they now wanted to prove themselves in the battle of Uhud. Some of them were quite young, and the Prophet ﷺ did not even give them permission. So they wanted to prove themselves in the battle of, of Uhud. Uh, so they requested that the Prophet ﷺ now go out and meet the enemy on the battlefield. And because this was the dominant view uh, in general, the Prophet ﷺ, he agreed to this. 
Later on, some of the uh, youth, they, they regretted their decision and they went to Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the other uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu to try to convince the Prophet Sallallahu to change his mind. And at this, the Prophet Sallallahu he made his famous statement where he said that it is not befitting for a Nabi when he puts on his, uh, his, his armor for him to take it off hatta yuqatil until he fights the enemy because this would show cowardice and weakness on the part of the Anbiya which is not befitting of them. So they went out with 1,000 people to Uhud and on their way there, there were various battalions and at the head of each of these battalions were different people and at the head of one of them was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul and he was one of those elderly Sahaba that was trying to convince the Prophet ﷺ not to go out to Uhud. And when he found that the Prophet ﷺ was doing this, he commented by saying that the Prophet ﷺ is leading us to certain death. I tried to convince him otherwise, but he did not heed my advice. And he expressed anger at this and resentment towards the Prophet ﷺ. So instead of even informing the Prophet ﷺ, they started to, uh, to, to, to basically break away slowly from the main army and at a certain point they made a u-turn and they turned around and they abandoned the prophet ﷺ altogether this was around 300 men and as you can imagine if you drop off from 1000 300 that's a significant decrease and this would have affected uh, any army in terms of their morale and also in terms of perhaps even their victory to have this type of drop off but he escaped the prophet ﷺ and he abandoned the muslimin in this time of need. And the Sahaba, they asked him why you're doing this. He made all sorts of excuses. This is mentioned, these excuses are mentioned, by the way, in Surah Ali Imran as well. We won't get into them. But they made all sorts of excuses to the Prophet. ﷺ. But the first lesson that we understand here is that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was one of the leader of the Munafiqun. And he abandoned the Muslimin in their time of need. Whenever you find people doing this, whether it's leaders, whether it's Muslims, when you have a sense of need for the Ummah and then they abandon them, then this is a quality of the Munafiqun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, prior to this, people might not have known that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, because his name was not revealed, was from the Munafiqun. However, in this context, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this verse we quoted, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيَذْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى مَا أَنْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى يَمِيزُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ Now it became very evidently clear who was where. And when we go further to this, again not to make it too long, but we'll just summarize it. In the time of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, and prior to him, Nuruddin Zanki and his father, Imaduddin Zanki, they faced this as well. That there were many uh, things they had to do before they were able to go into lands of the, uh, where the crusaders had attacked. One of those things was they needed to unify the Muslim Ummah. And one of the things and challenges they faced was the fact that many of the leaders, uh, Mu'ayyin ad-Din Unar was one of the particular people, one of the leaders of Dimashq, of Damascus, because they loved their seat of power so much, they loved their throne so much, they loved their position so much, they loved it more than defending the blood of the Muslimin. Because of this, many of those particular leaders in the towns of Damascus, of Homs, and in, in the Fatimid dynasty as well, who were Fatimi Shia at the time, they sided with the Crusaders against the Muslims. They sided with the Crusaders against the Muslims. Does this sound familiar? Right, so this is another lesson that we can derive from this. And in these situations and context, all of these leaders, all of these peoples, all of these entities that previously might have been with you and saying we support you, Allah SWT says, He will yamiz al khabith min al tayyib. And Allah SWT, and we'll conclude with this point, we can continue this uh, discussion as well tomorrow. Allah SWT mentions in the next uh, ayah, or in the, uh, some ayahs uh, also discussing this, this type of uh, context and situation. Allah SWT, He says something that we need to think about in this current context. Allah SWT says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, la tattakhidu bitanata min dunikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, do not take your closest associates, your closest advisors, as people that are not Muslim. Can we have relationships with non-Muslims? Yes, we can. But don't take your closest associates as people that are not Muslimin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes this very clear as to why. Some people have a problem with this and they say, uh, you know, Islam is, uh, uh, why, why are there these restrictions? These are good people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the reason why. Prior to all of this stuff happening, a lot of Muslims 
were leaning towards the political right. And what was the reason for this? the gender ideology and LGBTQ issues. They were leading politically right because they align with our, they were leading politically, my, uh, I guess your right is here, but my right is here. So they were leading politically right uh, because of the um, LGBT issues and, 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 and uh, gender ideology. And SubhanAllah, we see that when this event took place, then their true colors came out. People from the Daily Wire, Jordan Peterson is a famous example, I'm sure many people have heard of. When all of these situations happened, we used to follow them. But then their true colors came out with all of this. And that's why Allah SWT is telling us not to take your closest associates as people that are not Muslimin. Because the left, they want to kill your soul. The left wants to kill your soul, they want to kill your morality. And the political right, they want to kill your body. So we find in this situation, both of them, they want to kill you from different ways. And in this context, the best thing for you to do is ally yourself with other Muslimin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, what do ma aniddum? They only want evil for you. And after this, and we'll conclude with this part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, afwahihim. Their hatred has become now apparent from their words. وَمَا تُخْفِي صُدُورُهُمْ أَكْبَرُ And what is hiding within their hearts is far worse. An example of this is, as I'm sure many people have seen, uh, one of the advisors to the Obama administration. And there's a video which went viral in which she was abusing and hurling Islamophobic insults at a, a person who was, I think he was of Egyptian background, in New York City, and he was selling shawarmas. And this person was an advisor to the Ad Obama administration. Obama, from face value, seems like a pleasant person, very personable. Uh, very easy to get along with, has good social skills, and is able to convince people. He gave a speech in Cairo. But this person was an advisor to him in that time frame while he was putting up this huge, this entire front. And Allah SWT says, in context of war, their hatred becomes apparent from their tongues. 4,000 dead Palestinian children is not enough. These sorts of sentiments. And what they're hiding in their hearts is in actuality far worse. And Allah SWT says, ha antum wa la These are people that you have some love for. The politicians, they come here, you express love towards them, and you try to welcome them into our community. Ha antum wa la But they don't love you. And this becomes very evident and clear in this context that we find ourselves in, the, 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 the truthful and the righteous become very evidently clear from those that were hiding all along. And Allah SWT will use this as a context to make it evidently clear to the Muslimin which side is upon righteousness. Again, we can go further to this. We'll continue tomorrow, inshallah. But hopefully this was beneficial in providing some insight into some of these ayat which uh, discuss the events of Uhud and how we can apply uh, them in today's context. May Allah SWT make us from those that understand. May Allah SWT protect the people of Palestine. The bombardments have continued as we all are un uh, unfortunately all aware. And we ask Allah SWT to make the Muslims victorious uh, through all of these circumstances and to grant them patience and steadfastness and uh, make the Quran, as we mentioned in the dua, the spring of their heart. Rabi'a qulubina wa nura sudurina, the light of their chest. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.